Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us humble ourselves before God. Let us pray together a repentance prayer. Let us pray for this service and pray for each other. Would you humble yourself with me now and let us go to the Lord with one heart and one mind in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we humble ourselves before you. We know, Lord, that you are God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth. Lord, there's no way we can describe you because you are so far above us. But yet, Lord, you made us in your image, and you love us, Lord. And we have sinned and failed you, Lord. Have mercy on us, Lord, because you provided a way. And that way is Jesus, your Son, the Christ, the Messiah, the Holy One of God. Jesus, we know you died on the cross, but you were raised in power of the Holy Spirit. And you're alive today, and you hear us. And may that same Spirit be in us. May your Holy Spirit anoint us. Father, lead us and guide us for your glory. And please, Lord, again, we are sinners. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Let us come into your presence, Lord. Let us worship you in spirit and glorify you. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for every family that's represented here today and, and every soul, Lord, that hears your word. I pray for them, Lord, and I lift them up to you right now, asking, Lord, for you to lead us and guide us all. Please, Lord, forgive us. Let us come into your presence, not because we are worthy, but before the namesake of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, your Son, the Holy One, Lord, because of him we want to worship. And, Lord, we pray that you would lead us and guide us where we are weak, Lord, your strength would be with us. We pray, Lord, that we would put away the world and not worry about yesterday or later today or even tomorrow, but to give this time to you, empty our hearts, empty ourselves, and be filled with you during this time and all the time. May we draw near to you, Lord, through praise and worship, through your word, through your message, Lord. May we draw nearer to you and give you glory and honor. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now we're going to sing, Come Thou Almighty King. Come Thou Almighty King. Help us thy name to sing, help us to praise. Father, all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou in carnet bird, a gird on thy mighty sword. Our prayer attend. Come and thy people bless and kill thy word success. Spirit of holiness on us descend. Come, holy comforter, thy sacred witness bear in this glad hour. A thou who almighty heart now rule in every heart and ne'er from us depart spirit of power to the great one in three eternal praises be his evermore his sovereign majesty May we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. Amen. Amen. Now, 
when the Spirit of the Lord When the Spirit of the Lord burns upon my heart, I will sing like David sang. When the Spirit of the Lord burns upon my heart, I will sing like David sang. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing like David sang. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing like David sang. When the Spirit of the Lord burns upon my heart, I will clap as David claps. When the Spirit of the Lord burns upon my heart, I will clap as David clap. I will clap, I will clap, I will clap as David clap. I will clap, I will clap, I will clap as David clap. When the Spirit of the Lord moves upon my heart, I will praise as David prays. When the Spirit of the Lord moves upon my heart, I will praise as David prays. I will praise, I will praise, I will praise as David prays. I will praise, I will praise. I will praise as David prays. When the Spirit of the Lord moves upon my heart, I will dance as David danced. When the Spirit of the Lord moves upon my heart, I will dance as David danced. I will dance, I will dance, I will dance as David danced. I will dance, I will dance, I will dance as David danced. Amen. Praise the Lord. With me, and I ask that you to repeat after me as we go to the Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Amen. Please be seated. I love doing that. It never gets old for me. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's the child in me, the Lord's child. Hallelujah. This morning, if you would, I hope you have your Bibles open to the book of Jonah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. That's Jonah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Sister Berghauser is going to read for us in the Korean language, please, sister. 오늘 봉독하실 하나님의 말씀은 요나서 2장 1절에서 10절 말씀입니다. 요나가 물고기 배 속에서 그의 하나님 여호와께 기도하여 이르되 내가 받는 고난으로 말미암아 여호와께 불러 아뢰었더니 주께서 내게 대답하셨고 내가 소홀의 배 속에서 부르짖었더니 주께서 내 음성을 들으셨나이다. 주께서 나를 깊은 속 바다 가운데 던지셨으므로 큰 물이 나를 둘렀고 주의 파도와 큰 물결이 물결이 다내 위에 넘쳤나이다. 내가 말하기를 내가 주의 목전에서 쫓겨났을지라도 다시 주의 성전을 바라보겠다 하였나이다. 물이 나를 영혼까지 둘러싸우며 깊음이 나를 에워싸고 바다풀이 내 머리를 감쌌나이다. 내가 산의 뿌리까지 내려갔사오며 땅이 그 빗장으로 나를 오래도록 막았사오나 나의 하나님 여호와여 주께서 내 생명을 구덩이에서 건지셨나이다. 내 영혼이 내 속에서 피곤할 때에 내가 여호와를 생각하였더니 내 기도가 죽게 이르렀사오며 주의 성전에 미쳤나이다. 거짓되고 헛된 것을 숭상하는 모든 자는 자기에게 베푸신 은혜를 버렸사오나 나는 감사하는 목소리로 죽게 제사를 드리며 나의 소원을 죽게 갚겠나이다. 구원은 여호와께 속하였나이다 하니라 여호와께서 그 물고기에 말하, 물고기에게 말, 말씀하심에 요나를 육지에 토하니라 아멘. 아멘. 
Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surround me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord and my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Amen. May the Lord have blessing to read of his holy word. Let us pray, please. Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this holy word, and thank you for this message. And I thank you, Lord, for the people who hear it. And Lord, May your word accomplish your good and perfect will. May you touch hearts, Lord. May, Lord, you be pleased with this message to your people. And may we draw near to you. For it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we have here today Jonah's prayer. And in our scripture, it's one of the most powerful prayers ever spoken. It's not very long. Lots of people like to pray long, heavy prayers and like to use big words. But Jonah's prayer is powerful even though it's not that long. And it came from a desperate preacher that found himself in almost an unbelievable situation. This is an unbelievable situation. It's even hard for us to understand and believe. And, but you know something? I think, in fact, I know we all pray better and harder when we realize that the storm that we're going through or the situation in our lives is beyond our control. Do y'all not believe that? I know you do. If you are a prayer at all, you may not pray when you feel good. You may not pray when things are going good, but boy, let things happen that you can't control. And who do we call on first? God. Unfortunately, many of us have to wait till it's beyond our control before we pray to God. Anyway, here is a desperate prayer from a prophet who was cast into the sea and swallowed by a big fish. Uh, Jonah 1, 17 says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Listen, think about this. The Lord appointed and prepared this fish to catch Jonah and to swallow him alive. Now, some of you know how I think. Sometimes I love uh, when I'm reading God's Word and thoughts come to my mind. And and I've been thinking about this big fish, this great old big fish that all of us would love to hook on a hook and line. But he's a huge fish. I believe that God grew this fish from a fish egg. From a little bitty egg uh, years before. This, he grew this fish and prepared this fish. God prepared this fish to be the right size, uh, to be at the right time, and be in the right place to perform his will. Now, don't get me wrong. God could have just uh, uh, miraculously made the fish appear, but God uses his natural laws most of the time to perform his miracles. And so he had this little fish, grew it from a baby, grew it to the right size, 
It was at the right place at the right time just to swallow Jonah. Normally, men catch fish, don't they? But here we have a fish catching a man. Seems like it's sort of turned, right? It's changed. Now, this is all coordinated and executed by the hand of God. It was a divine miracle. God saw to it that the fish appeared at just the right moment, at just the right place, at just the right appetite to swallow Jonah whole. Can you imagine that? It's hard for us to even think about it. Here we have Jonah. He's taking a nap. He's taking a nap. He's on a cruise. A cruise line. You know, think about that. Those of you who've been on a cruise, he's, he's down and below deck, taking a nap, and he's headed for Spain. And then he's tossed into the raging sea. Uh, and then he's swallowed by a fish. And he spends three days in the belly of this fish. Can you imagine what it's like inside that fish? How many of you have ever been in the belly of a fish? None of you, right? But you know, most of you know, I can sometimes have a pretty vivid imagination when it comes to things like this. Because I'm trying to think, okay, I'm in the belly, the stomach of a fish. It's got to be dark, right? Dark because there's no sunlight. I don't have my flashlight with me. I don't have a lantern. It's pretty dark, and, and you probably can't move around. There's probably not a lot of room in there either. And this swim fish is swimming constantly, so I imagine I'm being slushed around in the dark. Salt water washes over you. You have to take a breath. Seaweed is wrapped around your head. Ooh. And, and it's slimy and unidentified objects. Things keep bumping into you. And you don't know what those things are, do you? The big fish eats other fish too, doesn't it? All fish eat, big fish eat little fish. And you have the seafood with you of whatever the fish is being eaten. And it's floating all around you. What a lovely thought. One other thing. Can you imagine the smell? Oh, man, this got to stink really bad. I mean, this, <laughs> all these dead fish rotting and, and being digested, it's, I'm sure the inside of this fish really stinks a lot. It's greasy and slimy and slippery, and the fish is trying to digest you. So Jonah finds himself in a life or death circumstance here. Now, I want you to notice something. Notice how Jonah feels. That's my first main subject here. How does Jonah feel about this? So Jonah 2 says, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Now, Jonah, he cries out to God for help. Then in verse 2, he says, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. And from the depths of the grave I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Hallelujah. It's amazing how prayer becomes so important to us when we're in real trouble. Abraham Lincoln, this is a quote from Abraham Lincoln. He said, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. And I want you to think about it. Is that the way you are in your life, in your prayer life? Do you only go to God when there's nowhere else? go. Jonah here is a desperate man praying a desperate prayer. Being thrust three days in the belly of the fish is not a very safe place to live, not a very nice apartment, is it? Not a very nice place at all. And it's a desperate place, if you ask me, to say a prayer. The problem with most of us, as long as we're in our boat, like he was taking a nap and we're on our cruise and we're down in this boat and we're sailing along and we're taking a nap and 
we're not going to be thinking much about praying at that time, are we? All is well, and, and just praying doesn't seem very important to us when things are going good. When we're doing our own thing and not really following the plans of God, praying seems to take a back seat to everything else. But God intends for Christians to use prayer as our first response to him, not our last response, not our last resort. Prayer is not a last resort. Prayer is something we should be doing all the time, and especially when things are going well, when things are going good, we should be praying and thanking God and talking to him and telling him what a wonderful God he is and how he has blessed us and done so much for us. But yet we wait till things are bad and we think things are hurting us and things are not going good. And that's when we call out to God. Don't wait until you get thrown from the boat. Don't wait till you're thrown into the ocean to pray, to bow your head and cry out to God. Jesus said that my house shall be called what? A house of prayer. His Father's house. A house of prayer. Prayer. Is this house a house of prayer? For some of you it may be, but for many it's not. Unfortunately, we don't pray as we should. My second main point is Jonah's confession. When the storm beat against that little boat and the crew, uh, they knew that their lives were in danger. Jonah actually admitted that he was the one that was guilty. He was guilty, and he was responsible for the storm. He was responsible for what was going to happen. He knew it, and he admitted it. He said, yes, it's because of me. Let me tell you something, and this is well worth writing down. You cannot change something that you did not admit. You can't change it unless you admit it. It won't change. Unless you admit it or confess it, there's no way it's going to change. Satan is very smart, crafty, and cunning. He will convince us that we're not really bad. We're not really all that bad. Ah, yes, I know the pastor. He reminds me I'm a sinner. Yes, I am a sinner, but I'm pretty good. I'm not really a bad sinner. After all, I'm not as bad as that person over there or that person over there. Uh, you know, I'm not committing bad sins after all. I'm, I'm just a regular sinner human being, right? And it does not matter what it is, though. Whatever sin you think you're hiding, guess what? It's still sin. Whether it's a little sin or a big sin, or nobody knows about it but you, you know God knows about it, it's still sin. And it's really only God you're sinning against. And until you get honest, honest, and quit lying to yourself, because that's who you're lying to, you're lying to yourself, you will continue to live your life that way, and when you live that way, you're living away from God. You know, the greatest lies we tell are the ones we tell ourselves. The greatest lie you'll ever tell are the ones you tell yourself. It's almost as if it's not a sin to lie anymore. Many have come to accept that, you know, lying's really not wrong, is it? Yet God says in his commands, thy shalt not lie. And yet we do it. Or maybe lying is just a fulfillment of Romans 3.13, where it says their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. You can't change what you will not admit. You can't help a liar. I can't help a liar. I've tried, but you can't. You can help anyone who's struggling with almost any sin as long as they admit their sin. If they admit 
and tell the truth, you can help them, and they can help themselves. But as long as they lie to you and they lie to themselves, what can you do? You can't help them. The situation is compounded by the fact that when most of us get caught, and many times we do get caught, don't we? You know what we do? We confess as little as possible. The real thing is we're just embarrassed, right? And we don't want to embarrass ourselves more by telling the truth. We're embarrassed because we're sorry we got caught. Think about that. We're sorry we get caught. Listen, true repentance always involves coming clean. Coming clean. Admitting it all. Admitting the truth. Say the truth. And coming clean means owning up to the sin. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. That's straight out of God's Word. There's three very hard words. You ever have a hard time saying these? How many of you say, I am wrong. It's very hard to say that. Can you, can you even say it right now? Repeat after me. I. See how hard that was? You couldn't even say I. I, I am, am wrong. Yeah. One more. I, I have sinned. I hope you meant it, because all those statements are true. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It's very hard for most of us to come to this place of total honesty with God and even with each other. It's very hard for husbands to be truthful with their wives and it's very hard for wives to be truthful with their husbands and they should be closer than anybody else. But we're really not that truthful even to our spouses, are we? Now, I'm not talking big secrets or anything like that, but I know we all have secrets, and we don't tell the truth all the time, do we? And we'll say, well, I don't want to hurt her feelings. I don't want to make her mad and upset. She, after all, she's sick. So many good excuses, right? Most of us face a continual battle to be transparent in our dealings. God's desire is truth from the inside out. We would rather do anything to include lying to keep from saying those words. It's my fault. I did wrong, I sinned. We make excuses. We'll rationalize. We'll, we'll make sure everybody understands why I'm lying. We, we justify ourselves. I'm, I'm okay, it's okay. And we twist the facts. We blame others. And the excuses just never seem to stop. They never end. That's the way mankind is. If you're that way and... You should think you are that way. You're not alone because we all struggle that way. Jonah here, he confessed, knowing full well probably what's going to happen to him. You think he didn't know that he was in trouble? So he confessed. He could have said, it's not me. I, it's not me, but he confessed to the crew, and in doing so, he was confessing before God. He knew he was wrong. He knew the storm was there because of him. 
So let's think about this prayer, this fragrant prayer from the belly of the fish. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. First, he cries out to God. This wasn't just a, hey, Lord, I need some help right now. I need your help. Jonah, he's really crying out. He says, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. And from the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. I love that last part. I cried for help, and you heard me, Lord. There's no doubt about Jonah's condition, is there? There's no doubt. He, he's not boasting here. He knows that if God doesn't save him, he will never get out of that fish alive. He has no hope. If God doesn't help him, there's no way he's going to get out. He was in distress. And I know, well, I can't speak for you, but I know for me, if I were in the belly of a fish, I would be pretty much distressed. How about you? Of course we would. He knew that God put him there, too. Jonah knows that God's the one that put him there. Verse 3 says, You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me, and all your waves and breakers swept over me. Don't misunderstand here, brothers and sisters. Jonah is not in the blame game. He's not saying, It's your fault, God. You're the one that put me here. He's not saying that. He doesn't blame the sailors for throwing him into the sea, into the ocean. He didn't blame the sailors. He knows he probably would have done the same thing. He doesn't blame the storm. He doesn't even blame this lousy fish that swallowed him. He doesn't blame any of them. You see, Jonah knew who was in charge. Jonah knew why he was in the fish. He knew God put him there. Jonah sees clearly that this trouble is a direct result of his disobeying God. His disobedience put him there. You know who really put him there? Jonah put himself there by disobeying God. Do y'all understand that? Yes, God put him there because of his disobedience. Jonah is facing the discipline of the Lord God of the universe. Jonah bows before God and he says, I know I'm here because you put me here, God. You know what? The fact, I think we make spiritual maturity, or at least we make progress, when we stop blaming others for our problems. Most of you have problems, don't you? You have problems in your lives, things in your lives. Stop blaming other people. Stop bl blaming the situation. And look what the blame really is of why you're suffering. Think about that. If you want to start growing spiritually mature, You've got to get to the point to where you're really looking at why I'm here and stop blaming others for our problems. Jonah knew that he must answer to the Lord God. He knew only God could have done this. You could, who could he blame for the fish? Could he blame the fish? Who would make a big fish like that? Who would put him right there when I'm thrown in the fish swallow? Who could do that? Only God. Because only God could get him out. He knew he must answer to God alone. And against God alone had Jonah sinned. Against God. Number five. God is his only way out. Once he's there, Jonah knows that God's the only way out. That's the only way that he can be saved. I can't expect somebody to catch this big fish and pull me out of the belly. There's no nets big enough to hold the fish. There's no hooks and lines big enough to hold it. Who's going to catch this fish and save me? Only God is the way out. 
There's no way out unless the Lord delivers him. Verse 5 says, The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. Seaweed? I don't like seaweed. You could ask people who fix me seaweed. I'm not much of a seaweed person. Milk, milk cook? Mm, that's not my favorite. I know it's supposed to be good for me, but I don't like seaweed. I especially don't want that seaweed wrapped around my head. Jonah is going to die in that great fish. There's no way out unless God Almighty, the Lord, brings him out. And he knows it. Apart from God, he's lunch for this big fish, and there's nothing he can do about it. It's not like he has a swift knife in his pocket. He can pick it out and start cutting his way out. He has nothing. There's nothing he can do about it. It was the power of God that put Jonah in that fish, and it would take the power of God to get him out. And Jonah knew it. Because God is his only hope. God's his only hope. Jonah remembers the Lord is his only hope. Verse 7 says, When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Now, Jonah is now acting like a true believer, I think. He's acting like a true believer after all the running away that he's done, after all the disobedience, after all the self-centered living. God has Jonah's undivided attention all of a sudden. Well, I think he would have my attention too if I was in the fish. It took a terrible situation. It took Jonah to be in distress. But finally, Jonah is seeing the light while he's in one of the darkest places he could be. And that is... He needs to serve the Lord. Jonah vows to serve the Lord. Verse 9 says, But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation come from the Lord. You can see this spiritual progress, this progression of his spirituality. He's, he, he's making progress. First, he acknowledges that God's the one that put him where he's at, that God allowed this to happen, not only allowed to happen, he made it happen. And second, he accepts that it's God that did it because it's God's discipline. He accepted God's discipline. And third, he thinks he's going to die without God's help. And fourth, he finally remembers the Lord. Then and only then does he vow to serve the Lord. And I think Jonah comes to a very great conclusion that we all must come to. Every single one of us must come to this conclusion. Salvation comes from the Lord. I don't know how, I don't know why, but this seems to be the hardest lesson for any human being to learn. Salvation always starts with God and it ends with God. Some of us struggle a whole lifetime to learn that. And most of us have to learn it over and over and over again in our lives. And some people never learn it at all. Those are the ones I have the deep, deepest concern for and pity for and sorrow for are the ones who never learn that salvation comes from the Lord. But there is. There is no salvation, no deliverance, no hope, no getting better until we re realize something. We realize that if God doesn't save, 
us, we will never be saved. If God doesn't save you, you never will be saved. I think that's an advantage of being in the belly of the fish. If you think about it, right? Most of us would probably improve spiritually if we spent a few days in the belly of a big fish. Right? I think some of us would. In the terrifying darkness inside this fish, Jonah realized the, fo the folly of fighting against God. He cries out and says, Salvation comes from the Lord. The only way any of us will ever get into heaven is by the grace of God. That's the only way. By the grace of God. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. Salvation comes from the Lord. Please don't ever forget that. So in conclusion, I want to conclude this. I want you to think about this. Although Jonah was a prophet, he was a prophet called by God, it appears that it had been a long time since he really had an honest talk with God. It's amazing and even frightening how easy it is for church people to go through life without talking to God. Now notice I didn't say Christians. I said church people, there's a difference. There's some people who go to church, they're not Christian. They just go to church. And it's amazing how some people can go to church most of their lives and never have a conversation with God. Why do you think Jonah prayed here in this big fish? this great fish. It's pretty simple. Jonah had reached the end of his rope. There was nothing else for him to do. Now, i got to tell you, it's a good thing to be desperate if desperation turns your heart to God. You may not like what I just said, but it's the truth. You may be desperate, and it's good if in desperation you turn to God. I can imagine few things worse than being in the uh, belly of a great big fish for three days and three nights. That's pretty bad. But i got to tell you, it's better to be in the fish talking to God than to be on the land running from God. No one is immune to trouble. Everybody has trouble. Everybody has situation in our lives. There is nowhere on earth where you are truly safe from heartbreaks and sadness and diseases and danger and death. Where can you go on earth in which you don't have to worry about any of those? There's no place that you can go. All that trouble can find you, the heartbreaks, the sadness, the diseases, the danger, the, the death. All that comes with you because you're a human being and you take all that with you. If there was heaven on earth, it wouldn't be for long when you got there. Think about it. If you want to live in heaven on earth, it won't be heaven once you move in because you're a sinner. We all are. If there's heaven on earth and we move there, we just changed it. It's not heaven anymore. God had to stop Jonah in his tracks in order to get his attention. In chapter 1, Jonah is disobedient, and he's running from God. In chapter 2, Jonah prays, and, and God hears him. God really de delights. He's so happy to deliver his people from impossible situations. Being trapped inside a great fish for three days and three nights is a pretty impossible situation, if you ask me. And even after Jonah gets right with God, guess where he's at? He's still 
in the fish. Jonah didn't pray after the fish put him on dry land. He prayed while he was in the fish. And when he finished his prayer, he was still there. We don't know how long he was in the fish before he wasn't. Some people have said he might have prayed that prayer the first day and he still had two more days in the belly of the fish. I know most of us think, oh, he prayed and then God said, okay, spit him out. You can think that if you want to, but it's not biblical. It doesn't tell us, does it? It doesn't tell us when he prayed in the fish. We just know he prayed in the fish. I don't know about you, Within the first 10 minutes in that belly of that fish, I'd be praying to God. Wouldn't you? Oh, are you going to wait three days? Some of you can say, well, I'm going to wait the three days. No, you're not. You're going to pray pretty quick. Right? But he had to wait at least two more days. Two more days. You see, he was right with God, but he was still there. So, Jonah knows he'll never get out on his own. So God works an amazing deliverance. Verse 10 says, the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah into dry land. Three days, three nights. I don't know when he prayed, but I know when I would have prayed. The first day, I would have been praying. You see, the same Lord who appointed that fish to catch him now tells the fish, let him go. Salvation comes from the Lord. Salvation comes from the Lord. That's why when Jesus himself spoke about this in Matthew 12, 39 and 40, he called his own resurrection, he called it the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jesus knew and accepted and believed. And the story of Jonah points us to Jesus. It points us to Jesus. And the gospel of Jesus tells us how far God will go on behalf of the guilty sinner. It just shows us how far God will go, how much he loves us. The gospel of Jesus, his son, he sent his son to the lowest place on earth and to die on that bloody cross of Calvary. And it's an emblem of suffering and an emblem of shame. And he sent his son, Jesus the Christ, and out of that shame, out of that terrible situation, came our salvation. Salvation comes from the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, mighty God, you saved Jonah from the, ba the belly of the fish, Lord. And yet, Lord, he, Lord, was in that belly. And we don't know how long after the prayer, but we know, Lord, that you saved him, Lord, and you spit him out on dry land. And we, Lord, we struggle with small problems here on this earth. We go through trials and tribulations. And many of us harden our hearts, Lord, and we don't humble ourselves before you. We don't confess our situation. We don't confess our sins. And we struggle, Lord. And, oh, Lord, have mercy on us and forgive us. We know that only you can save us. Only you can save us from our sinful situation. Only you can save us from ourselves, Lord. There's no hope without you. And I pray, Lord, that every heart, every soul would come to hear these words and they would take these words to their heart of hearts and that, Lord, they would pray to you that you would hear our prayers. And we pray, Lord, that you'd have mercy on us and forgive us. And we believe that Jesus is your Christ and you've showed us how much you love us by dying on that cross. 
Father, let us all come to you in repentance. Let us come to you and confess and receive and believe. Because, Lord, without you, what can we do? We're in the midst of a sinful world, and we ourselves are sinners. Oh, Lord, hear our cry. Hear our prayers. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Praise